snake that affects your nervous system. And so he had the shakes, and so he couldn't conduct anymore. And uh, Mr. Thompson had a, 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 he was a peculiar teacher. He taught geography. He had a three-second rule in his class. So he'd, you'd never get away with this today. But he had a piece of sail bait. You know sail bait? It's the thing that makes the sail firm and rigid, catches the wind. He'd walk around the class with it. And you'd never know. What? He'd hit you. What? It hits you, just randomly, random violence. South Africa, it's allowed, it's allowed. But, um, and his rule was, if you hit him back within three seconds, then it was an, a jerk reaction, an instinctive reaction. So it didn't count, it didn't count. You had a three second free hit at your teacher. Yeah, brilliant. Who, who would be a fan of that? Mary? And so uh, our class needed a champion to, to test this out. And bravely, I stepped forward. Mr. Thompson had a sailboat. I found a perspex plank. It was about that thick. It was about that long. Mr. Thompson walked around. Wow! Fuck you! Bit of a problem. I hit him so hard, my perspex plank broke, which left me with no defense. And so he battered me back. And I won't tell you about Miss, uh, uh, Mrs. Fundamava, who was the world, who was the South African shot put champion. So uh, you can imagine what her classes were like. He, she taught us uh, Afrikaans. And I guess if you want to succeed in life, uh, uh, you, you need good teachers, don't you? And if you are setting yourself up to fail in life, uh, then you ignore your teachers. And I wonder if you notice in this passage, uh, Jesus describes God as a teacher, as a teacher, verse 44 there. So how are we doing? Are we listening? Are we ignoring? No doubt we've got the universal report card, could do better, needs to not be distracted as much. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, um, uh, in this passage, it's a big passage, it's a bit, a bit of a beast. Uh, we're going to pick out three lessons uh, from God's classroom that are going to help us uh, navigate our way through this passage. Uh, so let's just uh, recap where we are in the story of John. We're in John's Gospel. We're in John chapter 6. And uh, there's our three lessons we're going to think about. Doing the Father's work. I'll, well, I'll reveal the surprise later. Being taught by the Father and then eat the flesh of the Son. And we're going to think about that later. And uh, here we are, here we are. Uh, last week we thought about how Jesus feeds the 5,000, feeds the 5,000 with bread, with bread. One boy's packed lunch becomes a meal for 5,000. And uh, it's a picture, Chris had that great illustration, all those bits. It was a picture of that Old Testament reading that we heard of men, of people eating manna out of the desert. And that's why your communion flakes looked like that. They're made to look like that uh, picture there. Uh, and then we saw how Jesus uh, gets crowded and they want to make him clean. So he goes up on a mountain to pray. Uh, and then his disciples leave and he's alone. And so he, he walks out to them on the water. Um, and that's a picture of how God parted the Red Sea. So Jesus, John's telling us Jesus is, is God and how the people walked on the water to get to the promised land. Uh, and then he says that big statement, I am, I am. And that's Exodus 3. The Bible nerds will know that. Moses and the burning bush, where God describes himself as I am. I am who I am. Who should we call you? I am who I am. Uh, and then we move to our reading this morning. And we're on the other side, the other side of the lake. Uh, it may be a synagogue. We're not sure. But there's a big crowd there. There's a big crowd. Uh, and they're asking him questions. Rabbi, when did you get here? When did you get here? And um, Jesus says to them, look, you, you're coming to me not because I am, you know who I am, but because you want food. You want the gifts rather than the giver. You want a free lunch. Um, and then he says, why don't you work for food that will last, food that will last? And they ask him, well, what is this work that we must do? What is this? What must we do? And he says, you must believe uh, and trust in God. You must believe and trust in God. And then they ask him, 
he's just fed 5,000 across the lake. They ask him, well, what sign will you give us? Which is a bit of an ironic question. And he says, well, look, I am, I am a sign. I am the bread of heaven. I've come down from heaven. I have come down from heaven. And the religious leaders, uh, the Jews, John calls them the Jews. He's talking about the religious leaders of the day. They object. They say, what do you mean? What do you mean? Don't be ridiculous. How can you say you come down from heaven? We, we know you. You're, you're Joseph's son. And then he says, he says, look, you need, you need to eat of me. Very tough. Truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the sun, unless you eat the bread of heaven, remember your relatives, they ate bread in heaven, bread from heaven in the desert, but they all died. None of them saw God's promise. Them. But unless you eat the true bread of heaven, real bread, real blood, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man, the real bread of heaven, you'll have no life in you. You'll never get uh, to heaven. You'll never get uh, to heaven so there we go so let's look at our, our first point there do the father's work believe in jesus and we look at verses 28 29 close your bibles uh, do open them up that would be a great encouragement and they asked him verse 28 what must we do to do the works god requires what must we do to live a life that will please god must we give lots of money to charity must we uh, 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 go to church every sunday and Jesus says, verse 29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who has sent him. We must believe uh, in Jesus. So what's the work? To simply believe like a child. Simply believe like a child. And the issue is, the issue here is just look, look down at verse 26, is that they haven't believed. They haven't believed. I tell you the truth, verse 26, you're looking for me, not because you saw the miraculous uh, signs, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. They want the gifts God gives, the rules, morals, that kind of stuff, but they don't want the giver. And Jesus says, look, the gifts are temporary. You'll enjoy those gifts and you'll be like your ancestors in the past who ate bread in the desert but died there. You need to value the giver. You need to value uh, the son. And as you do that, then you'll live. You'll live longer and you'll live better and you'll be with God forever. And that's the work of God, believing uh, in the son. And it sounds easy. Oh, yes, I'll believe. I, I'll, I'll tick the box. I'll tick the box, the, the Christian box on the census form. But it's harder than it sounds. Uh, last term, last year, we looked at Hebrews 3, uh, where, where in Hebrews, he talks about that wilderness generation. And what was the problem? The people saw lots of miracles. They were there among God's people day by day, Sunday by Sunday. But they didn't believe. They didn't believe. And so they died in the wilderness. They weren't true believers. They were among God's people, but not of God's people. And God, And Jesus here says, you need to believe in me, truly believe in me uh, to, to go to heaven. So that's the first lesson. Believe in Jesus, doing the Father's work. Sounds simple, but it's hard. What's that going to look like uh, for us day by day? And the second one is that we need to be taught by the Father. We need to listen to Jesus. And we're looking to uh, verses 34 to 46 here. Uh, and in um, 30, 40, 40, they have a discussion over God's will for your life. And I wonder if that's something that you've ever wondered. Maybe you've wondered, what am I here for? Why did God put me in Blackburn? What's going on? Maybe, um, maybe you've thought of some plan for your children. Maybe you've got some will for their lives. Maybe that they'll do something great and wonderful. I don't know. I don't know. But in this passage... Speaking to these people, Jesus tells them God's will. So you don't have to wonder. You don't have to wonder over what God's will is for them. So just look down at verse 40. And God the Father's will is not that rovers win the prem. Sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry. 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 It's not that I get rich and live a comfortable life. Although it's, 
it's good to plan ahead. It's good to plan ahead. It's good to work hard. It's not that our children get into the best school, but try if you can. And education is a great gift from God. No. Verse 40, my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. There's no greater purpose in your life than that you look to the son and believe in him. And he'll raise you to life on that last day. So I wonder if that's God's will for your life. How are you doing? How are you doing? What is my will for my life? Am I looking to the sun daily, day by day, doing the Advent readings? Am I trusting the sun in my daily hardships? Am I believing even when it's hard, even when my friends at work are, are, are being tough at me, even when the kids at school are picking on me for being a Christian? Am I dying to my own desires day by day and being ra raised to life again by Jesus day by day? saying no to what I want to do, and yes to what Jesus wants to do? Am I looking forward to living with the Son, with Jesus, eternally, uh, forever and ever and ever? But then we, we move on from this discussion on the will of God, and the religious teachers, the Jews, they start getting upset. They got, start getting upset, and we're in verse 41 here, 42. Uh, so I'll just read it again, uh, verse 41, verse 42. At this, the Jews, that's the religious leaders, they began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from the heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I come down from heaven? And what they're saying is, we know you. We know your father. We know your grandparents. What on earth are you on about? And the thing, so what's the issue here? Is that they are rejecting what Jesus says about himself. They're rejecting that he says he comes down from heaven. And so what's, what's the problem? What's the problem? Well, a little later in John's gospel, Jesus says, I don't speak on my own behalf. I only speak what I hear my father saying, what I hear my father saying. For I do not speak on my own, but the father who sent me, commanded me to say all that I've spoken. And so Jesus says he only speaks what God has told him to say. And so what's the issue for the Jews here? The religious leaders, they're rejecting what Jesus says. And in doing so, they're rejecting the words of God the Father. And so what's Jesus' response? Verse 44, just look at verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And then verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. So what's he saying? He's saying, yes, to believe in Jesus, we need to be called by the Father, hear the Father's voice, be drawn by him. But he's saying, look, if you knew your Bible, if you knew your Bible, which the religious leaders understood as God's word, if you had God as your teacher truly, then you'd realize that I'm speaking God's words after him. And you'd know who my father is. You'd see that I'm sent by God and you wouldn't reject me. And so he's, he's saying, if you, knew, if you knew the catchphrase, God's catchphrase, you'd know I was saying it. So here's some catchphrases. Favorite TV show catchphrases? Can you guess the TV show? This one's for the kids. Here's one I made earlier. Top marks. <laughs> I have a cunning plan. Blackadder, Baldrick, my favorite. No lighty, no likey. Bolton's favorite son. Paddy McGuinness, top marks. Brilliant. There you go. And you, you recognize the phrase because it comes off the show. I'm saying it, but you know where it comes from. And so Jesus is speaking, but he says, if you knew the show, if you knew God's word, if you had God as your teacher, you know where it's coming from. You know where it's coming from. And so I guess the, the question to ask ourselves is, am I being taught by God as I listen to Jesus? Am I being taught by God 
Am I listening to him? Am I listening to God? Am I listening to Jesus? Am I humble towards him, trying to understand as best I can? And I'm, am I treating every day like a school day? Every day is a school day in my daily Christian walk, trying to learn something more about what God is telling me uh, in his word. And the alternative is that if we don't listen to God, if we're not having God as our teacher, then someone else will be teaching us. Someone else. And there are plenty of teachers out there who will teach us. Someone else uh, will be teaching us. And so what's the issue here? Is the religious leaders, they've seen Jesus do things only God can do. They've seen him do mighty miracles. They've seen him, heard him teach in a way that only God can teach. Speak God's words after him. And what's their response? Who are you to teach us? We know you. We know your father. We know your grandparents. You grew up on Mosley Street, on Jack Walker Way. We know you. Who are you? And so what's stopping them from believing in Jesus? And this might be a thing for us. Pride. Pride. They don't want to be taught by God the Father. They don't want to be taught uh, by his son. And so they're lacking uh, humility. And so I wonder, are we being taught by God? Are we putting our pride down and trying to be humble? Are we growing in humility and listening to, to Jesus uh, daily? And as we do that, as we read the word, as we grow in this, are we, being, are we hearing the Father's voice and being drawn to Jesus, seeing his beauty? seeing his glory, seeing his kindness, seeing his gentleness, seeing his lowliness, how he fed the thousands, how he brings his people out of captivity into a glorious, uh, wonderful promised land. Are we being drawn by God uh, to Jesus? Or are we too proud uh, to listen? So the second lesson there, be taught by the Father, listen to Jesus. And then thirdly, the third uh, lesson there, is eat the flesh of the sun, feast on Jesus, feast on, I love a Christmas dinner, I love a Christmas dinner, uh, growing up we never did good Christmas dinners, we had cabbage, boiled cabbage for one Christmas dinner, it's another story, I won't, I won't tell you just now, um, but uh, uh, my mother-in-law makes amazing Christmas dinners, brilliant, every Christmas is amazing, absolutely amazing, Pigs and blankets, we don't have them in South Africa. I love them, absolutely love them. Yorkshire pudding, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We only do brides in South Africa because it's quite hot then. So uh, John 3, John 3 verse 5, Jesus says, you must be baptized by water and spirit to enter in the kingdom of God. But here in John 6 verse 53, Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You won't see God's kingdom. You won't get eternal life. And I think the, the picture here is that Jesus, he's speaking to an audience who have a false confidence, who have a false confidence. They're looking back to their ancestors in the desert and they say, look, they ate bread from heaven. We're safe. We're all right. We don't need to listen to you, Jesus. We've got them. We've got them. We remember them. But Jesus says, no, unless you eat the flesh of the Son, Unless you eat the real bread from heaven, you have no life in you. You've got no hope of eternal life. Verse, um, verse 53. And then verse 56, he gives the reason. Because whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. And you know, if I was a disciple, then that would have been really confusing to hear. Really, really confusing. Maybe that's a bit confusing uh, this morning. What does Jesus mean? So the Romans, the old ancient Romans, they used to think Christians were cannibals. They used to think they used to eat the spy called Jesus and poor Jesus. That's like they were running out of Jesus's to eat. They thought they were cannibals. And uh, it, it's not surprising. We see how the disciples respond in verse, verse 60, and you'll see this next week. Verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? 
and lots of them pull back and stop following uh, Jesus. And in uh, the history of the church, there's been different uh, understandings of this verse. So some people would say that where Jesus says, you must eat my flesh, he's simply repeating verse 29. You've got to believe. And it's simply a picture of faith. Uh, our Roman Catholic friends and, and brothers would say, uh, Jesus is speaking about the Lord's table here, the Lord's Supper here. Uh, and they're saying that when we have the Lord's Supper, somehow, mysteriously, down here on earth, the, the bread and the wine becomes Jesus' body in our mouth, in our mouth. And so they treat the, the wine and the bread with great reverence, great reverence. Anglicans, we're Anglicans. We believe we eat God's flesh. We eat Jesus' flesh mysteriously, but up in heaven, up in heaven up in heaven and so and so we're a bit more relaxed uh, down here when it comes to celebrating the lord's supper because the important thing is am i feeling spiritually is my heart ready not in how i do the sacraments down here is my heart ready because my heart is the thing that communes with god spiritually uh, in heaven and i think jesus is speaking about the lord's supper here but he's he's saying more he's saying more so I don't think he's saying you must have communion every week to be saved, to be one of God's people. I don't think he's being legalistic. But I think that he is saying that if you want to be his disciple, if you want to follow him, if you want to be one of his people, then you must be delighting in him, enjoying him, feasting on him continuously, ongoingly, moment by moment, day by day, week by week by week, joining in with God's people, enjoying, in, enjoying being in God's presence, being in Jesus and he uh, in you. And so 56, he, he says, he gives that reason again, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And being in Jesus, we mean being united to Jesus. And that's the most common way that the Bible speaks of being a Christian, being in Jesus. It sounds weird, I know. And it, it sounds a bit like a marriage, doesn't it? Being one flesh with one's spouse. And I'm, I'm new to the marriage game. I'm, I'm old, but I'm new to the marriage, young to the marriage game. And uh, marriage is a commitment. It's a, a commitment. You're making an allegiance, are you? And I, I realize for some of us, marriages are, are hard. But you don't, you don't get married once and then walk out the door and that's the end of the game. You can try that. Your spouse may have words with you about that. Your new bride might be unimpressed with you. Your new husband might be un unimpressed. It's day by day, for better, for worse, whatever. And so uh, lots of us, we might look to our, our baptism, our baptism, the day we got baptized. Uh, and we might, we might say that we're, we're saved, and that's it. We're in God's kingdom. We're one of God's people, and that's what we're looking to, that thing in the past for our assurance. And then we walk out of church, and we only come back at Easter and Christmas and, and funerals and maybe the odd, the odd marriage. But Jesus says, if that's us, then we shouldn't get any assurance from that. We shouldn't draw confidence from that. Look what he says again in verse 53. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink from his, his blood, you have no life in you. You've got no confidence of eternal life. And he means not a, a, a one-off action. I've done my communion for the year. Not something done joylessly as a chore, but as a joy. And he's asking us, where is our, our allegiance? He's asking us, will we feast with Jesus? Uh, will we feast with him? Will we put our feet under the table? Will we enjoy him? Will we enjoy being uh, with him and with his people? Is our allegiance with God, with, with him and his people? Are we a real fan or are we simply a, a country supporter? Are we in, are we in the mix? fighting the good fight uh, day by day, moment by moment. So great. As we come into land, there are, are three lessons from God's schoolroom. Do the Father's work. Believe in Jesus. 
Be taught by the Father. Listen to Jesus. Eat the flesh of the Son. Feast on Jesus. How are we doing? How are we doing? So do we believe in Jesus? Do we believe in Jesus? Maybe you're not there yet. That's okay. We're glad you're here. It's a great joy to have you with us. Uh, come speak to Chris or speak to myself or someone afterwards. Speak to a friend. Are you listening to Jesus? Uh, maybe you, you are happy with calling Jesus your Lord and, and Savior, but uh, you find some of the things that Jesus says in his Bible a bit, a bit hard and a bit offensive. That's okay. But what steps are we taking to listen to Jesus? Are we joining a, a house group? Are we trying to read the Bible for ourselves? And finally, are we feasting on Jesus? Are we feasting in Jesus? Maybe we have looked back to our baptism, we draw confidence from that. But are we feasting in Jesus day by day? Are we enjoying being part of his church? Are we uh, uh, love being with his people and enjoying the Lord's Supper together? Uh, do we love the family events? Do we, do we love being among God's people and serving God's people day by day? Great. Let's, uh, let's pray as we finish. So, our Father, we, we pray that we would listen to you. We pray that we would humble our hearts. Mm -hmm.